this meeting? And are you going to verbalize stuff tonight, or you want to send me a picture of some problems? Or um, Yeah, I can send you a picture. Give me one sec. That's probably the best way to do it, is to send me pictures. And here, let me write the email address that I want you to send them to. Okay. Uh, I got two email addresses, and one gets forwarded to the other. So the best one to use is this one. Now, hold on a second. I got to get this thing so there. David Cowan, C O W A N, 1949 at gmail.com. Okay. And yeah, once you send me one thing, the next time it'll be a lot easier. You only have to type the first couple letters and it should default. Tell me when it says sent. Give me a second. I'm, I'll be back in two seconds. Okay. sent yet? Uh, yeah, I just sent it. All right. How many pictures were attached? Just one? Just one, yeah. We uh, we just started going over this material, so I'm still a little shaky. Oh, wait. I didn't include the instructions. My bad. Give me one sec. Took a screenshot of it, but I didn't get it. Let's see what we got here. You can probably read the instructions. Yeah, yeah I can just read off the instructions. Okay. It just says... Um, so did you get the picture? Yeah. Um, it says, give the equations of any vertical, horizontal, or oblique asymptotes for the graph of each rational function. Okay. Let's talk about vertical asymptotes. They're the easiest. Yeah. What's the vertical asymptote on number nine? Uh, would that be five? It's a line. It's got to be oh, a um, of a line. So uh, y, x equal, it's x, x, equals five. x equal five. That's the vertical okay. asymptote. In other words, if I were going to graph this thing, I would start with that vertical asymptote at x equal five. Notice that that dotted line is not a point. It's a line. That's okay. x equal 5, okay? Yep. Now, is there a horizontal axis? Um, yes. Where is it? Um, y equals 3. Now, let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. Okay. They're a little harder. Yeah. If you have... The highest power in the numerator mm -hmm. is the same. Doesn't matter what else is involved. B plus a million. The horizontal asymptotes is only a function of the highest degree polynomial. Okay. If they are the same, which they are in this case, they're both squared, then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of their coefficients. So it would be 3? Correct. Yeah. If the bottom is bigger than the top, in other words, if this was a 1, so that the bottom is x squared and the top is only x, the horizontal asymptote is always y equals 0. 
So in that first problem, we had a vertical asymptote at five and we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero because the x is to the one power and the x in the numerator is to the zero power. So the x in the denominator, the, the, the denominator has the highest degree polynomial in it. Okay. Okay. Now, so far we haven't had any oblique asymptotes. You get mm -hmm. oblique asymptotes when you have this situation. When you have the numerator exactly one greater than the denominator, you have to do that division. In other words, I got to do x plus 3 divided into x squared, and I got to put a dummy variable in there in order to do this division. I got to do this division. You know how to do that division? Uh, kind of. Can we go over it? She taught it, but it was still yeah. it's kind of hard to go through. Let me use that so I can write on the black here. Uh, first thing you do is divide x into x squared, so you get x. Next thing you do is you multiply x by both terms. So I got x squared there plus 3x. That's why I need that dummy variable. You have to have all degrees of variables represented in both your divisor and your dividend. Now I subtract. That gives me minus 3x, minus 1, bring down the 1, do the process all over again, minus 3, and at this point, I don't care what the rest of it is. In other words, I, I'm going to multiply that minus 3 by the rest of it, but here's why I don't care what it is. I have my answer. In other words, I get a remainder of plus 8, but the equation of the oblique asymptote is always that linear answer, mm -hmm. regardless of what the remainder is. I don't really care about the remainder. The remainder is x over x plus 3. So that's a nice remainder, but it doesn't have anything to do with my oblique asymptote. The equation of my oblique asymptote is x minus 3. Okay, so if I go over here to my grid, well, that's, a, that's the wrong grid. Here, let me, x minus 3 is what I got. Let me erase and start over. So that division produces x minus 3 plus some remainder. Mm -hmm. So that's the equation of my oblique asymptote. Well, I started at minus 3. It's got a slope of 1. Most oblique asymptotes do have a slope of 1. So there's the oblique asymptote. And that is merely the equation of that line. Okay. Now, where was the vertical asymptote on 13? We'll get back um, to others, but I want to address this situation while we're here. So wouldn't it be uh, x equals negative 3? Uh-huh, which is this line right there. Mm -hmm. And now we kind of have our grid for to draw our hyperbolic function. Right. In other words, usually these are hyperbolic in nature. All of them that we're looking at here are called rational quotients. And most of them graph hyperbolically. You know what I mean by hyperbolic in nature? Yeah, it's kind of, it goes... Um, uh, in other words, that's a hyperbola yeah. like that. Only we got to put it on this grid, the grid that has the oblique asymptote and the vertical asymptote. Mm -hmm. Now, the way these graph is one of two ways. Either... Yeah, I better use the same color, otherwise I'm not going to show up on the black. It's going to look like something like this. Okay. Or the other possibility that it might look like is where it's 
asymptotic to those two sides. It's kind of like over here on the far left, mm. my graph is in the quadrants one and three. Sometimes it's in two and four. In other words, the red is, I just want to start with the most basic hyperbola, one over x. The yellow is minus one over x. So having that minus sign switches the, um, which section of the grid you're in. Yeah. Now, how do we determine that? Well, the best way is I know my answer is either the yellow or the pink, right? Mm -hmm. So let's pick a value for x equals zero and figure out where we what we get. That should tell us the difference. In other words, if I plug in x equals zero and I get a big negative number, I know I'm on the yellow. Mm -hmm. If I get a positive number, I know I got to be on the red. So if I plug x equals zero in there. I get minus one third. Well, that doesn't help, but it kind of does because I know that point is minus three. So minus one third is this red curve. Right. I don't know if I made that myself clear on that, but in other words, once I've laid out my dotted line grid, then I know I'm either in the first and third quadrants or the second and fourth quadrants. And to answer which one I'm in, pick a convenient value for x. Well, how about zero? If I let x equal zero on 13, I get y is minus one third. Well, mm -hmm. that certainly isn't minus one third, that point right there because it's below minus three. So the only thing that could be minus one third is that point. Okay, that makes sense. That's why the red is my graph. And I can erase the yellow. Now I'm not, sh not saying that that's necessarily the best way to always do these, to draw both curves, but it's not a bad way to think about it. Um, yeah, I think she said get the asymptotes and then uh, go through where you put in the, um, she used zero for x, so you put zero in for x and then you see which one and then you okay. Um, draw. Okay, that's probably a little bit more direct way to do it. In other words, determine whether I'm going to be in the first and third first before I draw both sets of curves. Yeah. And the moment I plug in zero for x and I get minus a third, that tells me I have to be in first and third quadrant right. because there's no way. Oh, you can incidentally cross oblique asymptotes. The curve can go through an oblique asymptote, just like you can cross horizontal asymptotes. The only asymptotes you can never, ever cross are vertical ones. Okay. Okay. Now let's go back up. Number 10. What's my vertical asymptote? Negative nine. What's my horizontal Your x equals asymptote? negative nine. And then uh, six, or no. negative six. No, the horizontal asymptote's always y equals zero. Okay. If I have yeah, a right. higher power in the denominator than the numerator. Right. That's true in both nine and 10. Now 11, it's not true. What's my vertical asymptote in 11? Um, X equals one half. Negative one half. Negative one half. Remember, it's whatever makes this denominator zero. 
That's got to be negative one half. If I made it one half, the denominator would be two. What's the horizontal asymptote? Um, and that's going to be a y equals something. Yeah. Because it's a horizontal line. Yeah. Do you do the uh, same thing with the numerator? Well, here we're looking at the same power of x. That's the biggest power of x in the numerator. That's the biggest power of x in the denominator. When they are the same, you just take the ratio of the coefficients. What's the ratio of the coefficients? Um, negative three halves? Correct. Or? That's yeah. your horizontal asymptote. Okay. Now, were the instructions here just find vertical, horizontal, and oblique asymptotes, or was it also to graph it? Yeah, they were, but uh, graphing would help me, so let's do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph them. Yeah. Okay, the vertical asymptote is at minus 1. Horizontal asymptote is at minus one and a half. Now, again, I know I'm either in the first and third quadrant or the second and fourth. So plug in zero for X again, and that will also tell us. What do you get when you plug in zero for X for number 11? Um, four. Okay. So when X is zero, Y has to be four. Right. Actually, it's way up here. That tells me that I'm looking at that kind of a hyperbola. Okay. Just always make it asymptotic to your asymptotes. Yeah. And... I can't be certain that these are always opposite diagonally from one another. In other words, if I graph this, got a vertical asymptote at zero, x equals zero, but the graph looks like that. It's not in first and third. It's in first and second. The reason is, is because of the squared. In other words, in this case, the bottom term is squared and the top term doesn't have an X. So you got to be a little careful about this first and third and second and fourth. Most of the problems I see on this page are going to be first and third and second and fourth. Okay. Uh, okay. This other situations, a little bit unusual. I don't see any problems on this page that, yeah, I do, right there. Um, no, no, that's, we'll get to that problem. That doesn't apply. All right. So we graph that. 12. Vertical asymptote. Four or x equals four. Horizontal asymptote. Uh, y equals two. And we're either on these. There's no x squareds all by themselves, so I know that's hyperbolic in nature. They're going to be first, and fourth, second, and third. Tell me how to figure it out. Um. So if we put 0 in for x, it turns into a negative uh, 3 halves. So this point right here has to be on the curve. Right, so it'll be in a 1 and 3. Yeah. That's really the only option. In other words, there's no way it could be 2 and 4 because there's no way that when x is 0, it's definitely minus 1 and a half. It's not plus 
would have to be plus for that to be the picture. Okay. Let's look at 13. We already did 13. Let's look at 14. Okay. First step, what's the vertical asymptote? Uh, one, or x equals one. Mm -hmm. What other kind of asymptote is there? Isn't there an oblique asymptote? Okay, how do we get the linear form of that oblique asymptote? Uh, you divide x squared plus 4 by x minus 1. You do that for me. Okay. What do I write inside? Um, you write x squared, or no, yeah, x squared plus 4. No, you got to allow for every power of x. With oh, double. x x squared plus 0x plus 4. There you go. Now do the division. Okay, um, so the first one you put x okay. on top. Mm -hmm. And so that's x squared minus x. Okay. Subtract. And then you subtract, yeah. So... Those cancel. Um, no, they don't. So You're subtracting. You got 0x minus a minus x. That's the same as 0x plus x. Plus x, right. So that yeah, I was talking about the uh, x squared. X. Yeah. Plus 4. Bring down the next term. Repeat. Um, so then you need to multiply by That's one. all I need. I'm done. That's the okay. answer. I don't care what the rest of it says. In other words, the only thing I'm going to end up with besides that is a remainder. And the remainder has nothing to do with what the horizontal asymptote or the oblique asymptote is. The oblique you asymptote is always that linear term. All right. So Will you the oblique asymptote is an equation y equal x plus 1. Right. That's the equation of the oblique asymptote. Right. Okay. Now, there's no horizontal asymptote. No. I don't think there is. In other words, I don't want to use the remainder, which would give you an, a horizontal asymptote of zero. I think it's just the vertical and the oblique. All right. So if I plot the vertical, the oblique begins at 1 and goes up. Yeah, the horizontal would mess things up if I did put one in there. And again, I know I'm either in this first and third or I'm in the second and the fourth. So let's figure yeah. out that out right away. Plug in, and I know that is at one. Right. Uh, so if you put x, uh, zero in for x, you'll get negative four. Okay. And so, so you have to be in uh, three so and in one. Words, our plot, our graph's got to be in there. That tells us where it goes. Right. In other words, it goes like this. Now, that point right there and that point right there, if they were to ask you the range of this function, uh -huh. you can't get that without using calculus. Okay. You could get it out of your calculator by putting it in there and asking for mins and maxes and doing the trace or actually on your inspire it'll just tell you what the mins and maxes are i believe but yeah. that that's a weird number that's going to be a number that's irrational and decimals and everything else so notice the domain would be negative infinity to one and one to infinity but the range is going to be negative infinity to whatever that value is and then whatever that value is to positive infinity. So the range is quite difficult to come up with on these functions that have oblique asymptotes. Okay. Okay. 
you either have to use calculus or a calculator. All right, on 15, what's the first thing I need to do to figure out vertical asymptote? Um, do you have to factor do. the bottom? Uh-huh, let's factor it. Go ahead. Um, so... It's basically a, well, the second step in factoring is always figure out both signs. What are both signs? Right. Uh, both, well, it'd be a negative and a positive. Yeah, they have to be opposite. But yeah. because the coefficient in front of the x's are different, I have to allow for both. So I do it this okay. way. I don't know if this is the way your teacher does it or not, but I allow for both. In other words, either plus minus or minus plus. One thing I know is they have to be opposite. Well, I'm looking for factors of 10, right? The most likely factors that they are talking about are 5 and 2. Uh -huh. And I have to produce this middle term of minus 1x. Well, clearly, if I put the 5 over on the right side, I'm going to have 5 times 2x. That's going to be 10x. I'm never getting to minus x. Right. So the 5 is going to have to go... I'm going to put it right there for the moment, which means the 2 would go there. And now you have to determine whether that produces the middle term or not. And you do that by figuring out the O and the I of FOIL. They've taught you FOIL, yes? Yeah. Because not everybody gets taught those terminology anymore. They don't always call it FOIL anymore. But yeah, no, we did that. Uh, if you were taught FOIL, then you, the O, the outside, and the inside combined are what give you the middle term. Well, the inside is plus 5x. The outside is minus 4x. Add them together, and I get plus x. Well, that's not the middle term, but it's the right number. It's a 1. So switch the signs? Sign. Yeah, move the 5 down to the minus sign and the 2 down to the plus sign. So the factors are 2x minus 5 times x plus 2. And you'll see right. that that produces a middle term of minus x. So we factored it properly. Now what does that tell us about the asymptote? vertical asymptote. Um, are there going to be two? There are going to be two. In other words, vertical right. asymptotes come wherever the denominator is zero. There are two values for x that are going to make this denominator zero. What are they? Uh, negative two and five halves. Those are my two asymptotes. So when I draw this, I'm not going to have four quadrants. I'm going to have basically six. There's negative two. And there's positive two and a half. And how about horizontal asymptote? I'm on number 15. All right, so it'd be one half. Correct. Or y equals one half. Correct. So now that's my grid to work with. Right. Now these, let me show you what the standard plot is going to look like. And then we have to figure out a lot of stuff to graph this. Okay. Here's the most likely scenario. That and that. And then what goes on in the middle is what's of question. Usually what goes on in the middle is something like that. So that would be a likely looking result. Or this where the middle 
goes up, doesn't cross the x-axis, comes back down, and then the rest of it is like that. So those are going to be the two most common shapes of graphs that we're going to get. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's figure out how to how to graph it. Um, first of all, what determines the middle is if there are any x-intercepts. Notice that in the picture that I have just drawn, there are no x-intercepts. Right. So if I can solve this equation and come up with an x-intercept, then I know this isn't the right picture. I got to go through the x-axis with my black curve. Well, for 15, how do I solve for the x-intercepts? Um, if you put x into zero, no, right? that, no. Think about it for a moment. When you're on the x-intercepts, y is zero. When you're oh, right. on the y-intercept, x is zero. So right. plug in zero for y, which is okay. half of x, and solve. Now, here, here's something else that's really important. If you have a quotient that is equal to zero, in other words, here's what I'm doing. I'm plugging in zero for that. Well, the only way that can be equal to zero is if the numerator is equal to zero. Right? Right. I mean, the numerator happens to factor also. And if one of the factors was in common with the denominator, I could cancel it. But it doesn't factor like that. It factors into x minus 3 times x plus 1. Right. Remember, the bottom was 2x minus 5 times x plus 2. So I can't cancel anything out. But I can definitely tell that my x-intercept, I got two of them. It's going to cross the x-axis at 3 and minus 1. Well, where is 3? Three? 3 is right here. That point is on my curve. It also is going to cross at minus 1. That's minus 2. So it's got to cross at that point also. So it's beginning to look like my picture, I'm not in that quadrant at all. I got to be down here. And let's just figure out what quadrant we're in here over on the far left. Okay. Because that's going to help a little bit. Um, in order, that is at minus 2, so if I plug in minus 3 into this equation, what do I get? If you plug minus 3 in as... Um... Yeah, into the whole thing, but it's easier to do if you plug it into the factor. Here, here over here I'm going to put the numerator and the denominator, both factored. I'll plug in minus 3, and we'll know where this curve is on the far left side. You plug in minus 3, you get, let's see, that becomes minus 6, that becomes minus 2. This right. becomes... Minus 6, minus 5, minus 11, and this becomes minus 1. So what is that? That is plus 18 over plus 11. So 18 elevenths greater than 1. 
greater than yeah. my horizontal asymptote. Yeah. That tells me that I'm over here. Right. Now, what's going on in the middle? I still got a couple possibilities. I still can go from lower right all the way up through that x-intercept all the way up to the top. But that tends to disagree with the principle, which is when you're going from right to left across these, hors these vertical asymptotes, if I'm going down to negative infinity there, then I'm coming out from positive infinity. Ah, this is what it's going to look like right there. And likewise, I'm going down to negative infinity there. So on the other side of the asymptote, I'm coming up from positive infinity. That's what that curve looks like, guaranteed. All right. Now, let's just check. Got a good picture of that? Yeah. Uh, I got to write this down because once I go to my Wolfram Alpha page, I, uh, I won't be able to see this. So I've got x minus 3 times x plus 1, all divided by 2x minus 5 times x plus 2. Let's have a look at the curve and make sure that it's what I drew. Wolfram Alpha, incidentally, is an excellent online source of an online calculator. You'll see right. it in just a second. Uh, it's a great calculator because it tells you exactly what you put in. Uh, in other words, on the old PI-84s, you could never tell what you'd put in. So it really made it tough. Yeah. Whereas now, with the Inspire, you can. It gives you the feedback of what you put in. Right. All right, let's see if I've entered it properly. Uh, apparently, I did not. Uh, x minus 3 times x plus 1, all divided by, let me add some double parentheses here. Yeah. I need a parentheses there, and another one there, and I think that will, oh, no, I'm going to need one in front too, aren't I? There. And there. Now, it should tell me exactly what I put in, and it does. Okay. Now, the graph it gives you, that's what we graphed. Precisely. It looks a little funny because the bottom view is zoomed way out, and the top view is zoomed way in. So, hey. remember what my graph looked like, and that is what we're looking at. My graph looked like the following. I had two asymptotes, and it went like this. Let's see. Uh, the bottom went like that, and it went like that. And this side went like that. Okay. That, you can see, matches my everything but the middle. And that's the middle. So when they zoom real close into it, you can see that middle. When they zoom far out, you can't see it. There's actually a line going through there. It's just not visible on Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. If you graph that on your Inspire, you'll see this over here. As long as you have the right window, the viewing yeah. window. 
know, but the Inspire is pretty good about the viewing window. Also much better than the TI-84. Yeah. Anyway, that's what you have to do with these problems that have more than four quadrants. Um, is they usually, they have what I call six quadrants. In other words, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and then there's the one in the middle. There's five quadrants. Right. Okay. And, you know, depending on the equation, you might have three linear terms in the denominator. So you can have three vertical asymptotes. And then right. you have seven quadrants to deal with. Right. So there's no limit to the complexity, um, but the strategy is pretty much the strategy that I just went through. Uh, in other words, you got to figure out what it's doing on the right side, what it's doing on the left side, and what it's doing in the middle. And the biggest question about what it's doing in the middle comes from, is there an x-intercept? Because right. notice that if the middle were doing something like this only, there wouldn't be an x-intercept anywhere. And so when I go to solve for the x-intercept, I get no solution. There's no way, if I cannot make the numerator equal zero, then there's no x-intercept. And if there's no x-intercept, I know what that thing does. It doesn't cross the x-axis. It goes up and comes back around. Or I suppose it could go down and come back up, but it doesn't cross the x-axis. So figuring out the x-intercepts is always a key part of these problems where you have more than four quadrants. Right. Okay. Now, let me just see if I can just, yeah, do this. No. Unfortunately, it doesn't let me zoom in when I do it that way. Uh, let's see. We got about 10 minutes. We can do another one of these complicated ones. Yep. Let's see if we can find a good one. Uh, rather than spending 10 minutes doing a lot of math, however... Let's start. Set, let's just answer these questions on seventeen. Okay. Let's let's go to seventeen straight, and if we have time, we can go back and do sixteen. Sixteen is just going to be very time consuming. Which right. which function does not have a vertical asymptote, and why? Um. Would it be C? No, C, if X were zero, that's the vertical asymptote. That makes the denominator right. zero. Remember, that's how you get vertical asymptotes. It's whatever makes the denominator zero. Right. Well, D, eight will make the denominator zero. B, yeah. square root of two makes the denominator zero. How do you make the yeah. denominator zero on A? X squared is always a positive number, and you add two to it. That ain't never going to be right. zero. So that's your answer. Right. Is A. 18. Which function has a graph that does not have a horizontal asymptote? So A would be 2. Okay. Um, B would be what? B, um, Remember, if the bottom is bigger than the top, it's always it's zero. Zero. Always y yeah. equals zero, yes. Yeah. Um, D would be what? C? No, D. Uh, D, you would... Um, Notice that the bottom is x squared. Yeah. Top is x. So where's the horizontal axis? So zero. Correct. Zero. So, so it, has to be C. it has to be C, and the reason it's C is because the top is bigger than the bottom. So you have right. to do the division, and you end up with an oblique asymptote. Right. Actually, you don't. 
if I do the top, the top here, let me show you real quick, you end up with a hole. You familiar with holes? Yeah. Well, here's what the top is. X minus 3 times X plus 3. Oh, and then the X, uh, X plus, plus three. 3. Yeah, so they cancel that. Those cancel. So this thing is just a straight line going through minus 3 with a slope of 1. There is one thing about it, though, and that is that there has, there's always the domain restriction that X can never be minus 3. Right. That does not go away. Even though I factored it out and canceled the X plus 3 out, I still have that domain restriction. So at X equal minus 3, I have what is called a hole. I have no vertical asymptotes. I have no horizontal asymptotes, but I do have a hole. Right. In other words, what would have been a vertical asymptote at minus 3 disappeared because that got factored out, but it left a hole. So you get holes from things that would have been vertical asymptotes that got canceled with a factor in the numerator. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let's see. The only other one to look at is 16. Yeah. Let's start by factoring a numerator. Okay. What's the best way to factor that? Uh, you can factor a 3 out three. right away. And that helps because it leaves a much simpler quadratic to factor. Yeah. And the bottom, can't factor any greatest common factor out. But let's right. see, the top becomes 3 times x minus 4 times x plus 2, that's what the top is, mm -hmm. bottom, I suspect the bottom factors, otherwise they wouldn't have given us this problem, Yeah. and it must factor into 5x and x, the signs have to both be negative, and that's got to be a 5, and that's got to be a 1, that will give me yeah. minus 26x. Now, notice the first thing I want to check for is to see if anything cancels with the top, and it doesn't. Yeah. So now I'm dealing with that. Well, that's got <coughs> two vertical asymptotes. It's got a horizontal asymptote at three-fifths. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to start with. Yeah. So let's... So let's see. It's got a vertical asymptote at one fifth. It's got another vertical asymptote at five. Okay. And it's got a horizontal asymptote at three fifths. So there's our dotted line grid. Yeah. Now, let's see if there's any x-intercepts. That's always a good thing to solve for next, actually, are x-intercepts. Anything that makes the numerator zero, that's where your x-intercepts are going to come from. Um, Take this, that solve that. Set it equal to zero and solve it. Use the zero product property of algebra. Right. In other words, if that's equal to zero, how can that be equal to zero? Only if that's equal to zero and that's equal to zero. Mm -hmm. so those are my x-intercepts. At four... And at negative 2, negative 2, negative two being right there. So I know my curves have to go through that. And you don't do anything with the 3, right? Right, because that doesn't have anything to do with it. In other words, if I set that entire numerator equal to 0, I can divide both sides by 3. Right. 
and still it's only going to be equal to zero if x is equal to four or x is equal to minus two. Okay. Okay. So I know those are my x-intercepts. Kind of tells me how to draw that part of it, right? Yeah. Okay. And doesn't tell me how to draw the middle, but I can, let's pick a point to the right of five. This is at five right there. Right. And plug it in. Let's pick six. Okay. What does this whole thing become when I get six? Let's see. I got three times two times eight in the numerator. I got 29 times one in the denominator. That's 48 over 29. That's almost two. Yeah. Well, that means I'm up here. Because right. this line was at three-fifths, or one, excuse me, that line, that horizontal amplitude three was at three-fifths. So yeah. if when X is to the right of that right vertical asymptote, it's telling me I'm above the horizontal asymptote, that tells me that that's the way that looks. Right. Now, again... Because if I'm looking from right to left and I'm going up to infinity against that horse, that vertical asymptote, I'm coming out from down here. And I know it crosses. Right. So, and I, I know almost for certain that I got to end up up there because I come out on the other side. Yeah, because you got to fall. Yeah. So that really is the picture. Now, notice that the middle does cross. The horizontal yeah, asymptote. Yeah. In other words, is that point really on my curve? Well, I'm going to figure that out. That point is three-fifths, right? Yep. So if I can set that thing equal to three-fifths and solve it, then I know it goes through that horizontal asymptote. Right. Okay. And because there, there, there still are a couple of decisions here. In other words, how did I know it didn't do this? Other than the fact that it doesn't come out with this far left one properly. Um, maybe I don't need to do much more checking. In other words, I figured out that it was in the lower left quadrant. And I figured out that it was in the upper right quadrant. And I figured right. out that it does go through the x-axis. So I'm pretty comfortable with that, whoops, with that solution. I'd probably end it right there. Okay. Now, I'm presuming that you can't use a calculator on these questions? Um, so probably do some of them with calculator, some of them without. Okay. Well... The only good a calculator would do is show you the graph. In other words, I didn't need a calculator to draw this graph. Now, granted, I guessed at a couple of things. I guessed that the middle went from lower right up right. through the horizontal asymptote all the way up to infinity. But I'm 90% sure that that is the correct picture. The, yeah. The only thing a calculator would let you do is check and make sure that you got the right picture. Right. You don't really need a calculator to solve it. Yeah. You just need a calculator to verify that what you drew is correct. Um, hmm. And you could do some other tests. In other words, I could I could let X kind of approach. What is that? That's plus two. No. Yeah. No, that's one fifth. Okay. Oh, right. So I could let X approach one fifth from the right side. What should happen is it should go to infinity as I'm getting closer and closer to one fifth. And you can kind of see that is what's going to happen. When I yeah. substitute one fifth in there, that becomes one. One minus one is zero. So if I'm right to the right of one-fifth, 
that's going to be an extremely small number. And the smaller yeah. the denominator gets, the bigger the answer gets. So it makes perfect sense that as I approach one-fifth from the right, this function goes up to positive infinity. Right. So now I'm 99% sure I got it right. All right. Sam, I'm going to let you go. I got another appointment at 8. Oh, sorry. Okay, Sam. cool. I meant uh, Hayden. No, Hayden. Yeah, it's fine. Huh. Uh, my last student was Sam. But well, today is great. Today has been really busy. So, yeah, anyway, right. I will talk to you next time. You guys obviously know how to uh, schedule online. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I will send you a copy of this recording for you to review. Uh, you should have it by.